Welcome to my channel. I'm screen recorder, and today I will be talk about story telling, the yellow dwarf. Remember to subscribe to my channel to listen to more story telling. The yellow dwarf. It's about a yellow dwarf forces a queen and her daughter to make a promise they cannot keep. Once, once upon a time, there lived a queen, who had been the mother of a great many children, and of them, all only one daughter was left. But then she was worth at least a thousand. Her mother, who, since the death of the king, her father, had nothing in the world she cared for so much as this little princess. Was so terribly afraid of losing her that she quite spoiled her, and never tried to correct any of her faults. The consequence was that this little person, who was as pretty as possible and was wanting to wear a crown, grew up so proud and so much in love with her own beauty that she despised everyone else in the world. The queen, her mother. By her caresses and flatteries, helped to make her believe that there was nothing too good for her. She was dressed almost always in the prettiest frocks, as a fairy or as a queen who going to hunt, and the ladies of the court follow her dress as forest fairies. And to make her more vain than ever, the queen caused her portrait. To be taken by the cleverest painters and sent it to several neighboring kings, with whom she was very friendly. When they saw this portrait, they fell in love with the princess, every one of them. But upon each, it had a different effect. One fell ill, one went quite crazy, and a few of the luckiest set off to see her as soon as possible. But this poor princess. Became her slaves the moment they set eyes on her. Never has there been a gayer court. Twenty delightful kings did everything they could think of to make themselves agreeable, and after having spent ever so much money in giving a single entertainment, thought themselves very lucky if the princess said, "That's pretty." All these admirations vastly pleased the queen. Not a day passed but she received seven or eight thousand sonnets, and as many elegies, marigolds, and songs, which were sent her by all the poets in the world. All the prose and the poetry that was written just then was about Bellissima, Bellissima, for that was the princess's name. And all the bonfires that they had were made of these verses, which crackled and sparkled better than any other sorts of wood. Belisama was already fifteen years old, and every one of the princess wished to marry her. Oh, I'm so sorry, and every one of the princess wished to marry her, but no one dared to say so. How could they when they knew that any of them might have cut off his head five or six times a day just to please her, and she would have thought it's a mere trifle? So little did she care. You may imagine how hard-hearted her lovers thought her, and the queen, who wished to see her married, did not know how to persuade her to think of it seriously. Belisama, she said. I do wish you would not be so proud. What makes you despise all these nice kings? I wish you to marry one of them, and 
you do not try to please me. I am so happy, Bellissima answered. Do leave me in peace, madam. I don't want to care for anyone. But you would be very happy with any of these princes, said the queen. And I shall be very angry if you fall in love with anyone who is not worthy with, of you. But the princess thought so much of her that she did not consider any one of her lovers clever or handsome enough for her. And her mother, who was getting really angry at her determination not to be married, began to wish that she had not allowed her to have her own way so much. At last, not knowing what else to do, she resolved to consult a certain witch who was called the Fairy of the Desert. Now this was very difficult to do, as she was guarded by some terrible lions. But happily the queen had heard a long time before that whoever wanted to pass these lions safely must throw to them a cake made with millet flour, sugar candy and crocodile's eggs. This cake should be prepared with her own hands and putting it in a little basket. She set out to seek the fairy, but as she, she was not used to walking far, she soon felt very tired and sat down at the foot of a tree to rest, and presently fell fast asleep. When she awoke, she was dismayed to find her basket empty. The cake was all gone, and to make matters worse, at the moment she heard the roaring of the great lions, who had found out that she was near and were coming to look for her. What shall I do? she cried. I shall be eaten up. And being too frightened to run a single step, she began to cry, and leaned against the tree under which she had been asleep. Just then, she heard someone say, Hmm, hmm. She looked all around her, and then up the tree, there, and there she saw a little tiny man who was eating oranges. Oh, queen, said he, I know you very well, and I know how much afraid. You are of the lions, and you are quite right too, for they have eaten many other people. And what can you expect, as you have not any cake to give them? I must make up my mind to die, said the poor king. Alas, I should not care so much if only my dear daughter were married. Oh, you have a daughter, cried the yellow dwarf who was so called because he was a dwarf and had a sharp yellow face and lived in the orange tree. I'm really glad to hear that, for I've been looking for a wife all over the world. Now, if you will promise that she shall marry me, not one of the lions, tigers or bears shall touch you. The queen looked at him and was over as much afraid of his ugly f little face as she had been of the lions before, so that she could not speak a word. What? You hesitate, madam? cried the dwarf. You must be very fond of being eaten up alive. And as, she sp and as he spoke, the queen saw the lions, who were running down a hill toward them. Each one had to a head eight feet and four rows of teeth, and their skin were as hard as turtle shells and were bright red. At this dreadful sight, the poor queen, who was trembling like a dove when it sees a hawk, cried out as loud as she could, Oh, dear Mr. Dwarf, Belisima shall marry you. Oh, indeed, said he, this thankfully, Belisama is pretty enough, but I don't particularly want to marry her. You can keep her. 
Oh, noble sir, said the queen in great distress. Do not refuse her. She is the one most charming princess in the world. Oh, well, he replied. Out of charity, I will take her. But be sure and don't forget that she is mine. As he spoke, a little door opened in the trunk of the orange tree. In rushed the queen, only just in time, and the door shut with a bang in the faces of the lions. The queen was so confused that at first she did not notice another little door in the orange tree. But presently it opened and she found herself in a field of tisters and nettles. It was encircled by a muddy ditch, and a little further on was a tiny thatched cottage, out of which came the yellow dwarf, with a very zanty air. He wore wooden shoes and a little yellow coat, and as he had no hair and very long ears, he looked altogether a shocking little object. I am delighted, said he to the queen, that as you are to be my mother-in-law, you should see the little house in which your Bellissima will live with me. With these titters and natus, she can feed a donkey, which she can ride whenever she likes. Under this humble roof, no weather can hurt her. She will drink the water of this brook and eat frogs, which grow very fat about here. And then she will have me always with her, handsome, agreeable, and gay as you see me now. For if she, for if her shadow stays by her more closely than I do, I shall be surprised. The unhappy queen, seeing all at once what a miserable life her daughter would have with this dwarf, could not bear the idea and fell down insensible without saying a word. When she revised, she found to her great surprise that she was lying in her own bed at home, and what was more, that she had on a loveless lace nightcap and she had ever seen in her life. At first, she thought that all her adventurous, the lion, terrible lions, and her promise to the yellow dwarf that he should marry Bellissima must have been a dream, but there was the new cat with its beautiful ribbon and lace to remind her that it was all true, which made her so unhappy that she could neither eat, drink, nor sleep for thinking of it. The princess, who in spite of her will, wellfulness, really loved her mother with all her heart, was much grieved when she saw her looking so sad, and often asked her what was the matter, but the queen, who didn't want her to find out the truth, only said that she was ill, or that one of her neighbors was threatening to make war against her. Bellissima knew quite well that something was being hidden from her, and that neither of these was the real reason of the queen's uneasiness. So she made up her mind that she would go and consult the fairy of the desert about it, especially as she had often heard how wise she was, and she thought that at the same time she might ask her advice as to whether it would be as well to be married or not. So. With great care, she made some of the proper cake to pacify the lions, and one night she went up to her room very early, pretending that she was going to bed. But instead of that, she wrapped herself in a long white veil and went down a secret staircase and set off all by herself to fight the witch. But when she got as far as the same fatal orange tree, and saw it covered with flowers and fruit, 
She stopped and began to gather some of the oranges, and then, putting down her basket, she sat down to eat them. But when it was time to go on again, the basket had disappeared, and though she looked everywhere, not a trace of it could she find. The more she hunted for it, the more frightened she got, and at last she began to cry. Then, all at once she saw before her the lion dwarf, the yellow dwarf. What's the matter with you, my pretty one? said he. What are you crying about? Alas, she answered, no wonder that I am crying, seeing that I have lost the basket of cake that was to help me to get safely to the cave of the fairy of the desert. And what do you want with her, pretty one? said the little monster, for I am a friend of hers. And, for the matter of that, I am quite as clever as she is. The queen, my mother, replied the princess, has lately fallen into such deep sadness that I fear that she will die, and I am afraid that perhaps I am the cause of it, for she very much wishes me to be married. And I must tell you truly that as yet I have not found anyone I consider worthy to be my husband. So, for all this reason, I wish to talk to the fairy. Do not give yourself any further trouble, princess, answered the dwarf. I can tell you all you want to know better than she could. The queen, your mother, has promised you in marriage. Has promised me? Interrupted by the princess. Oh no, I'm sure she has not. She would have told me if she had. I am too much interested in the matter for her to promise anything without my consent. You must be mistaken. Beautiful princess, cried the dwarf suddenly, throwing himself on his knees before her. I flatter myself that you will not displease at her choice when I tell you that it is me she has promised the happiness of marrying you. You? cried the burly Sima, starting back. My mother wishes me to marry you? How can you be so silly as to think of such a thing? Oh, it isn't that I care much to have the honor, cried the dwarf angrily. But here are the lions coming. They will eat you up in three mouthfuls, and there will be an end of you and your pride. And indeed, at that moment, the poor princess heard their dreadful howls coming nearer and nearer. What shall I do? she cried. Must all happy days come to an end like this? The malicious dwarf. Looked at her and began to laugh spitefully. At least, said he, you have the satisfaction of dying unmarried. A lovely princess like you must surely prefer to die, rather than be the wife of a poor little dwarf like myself. Oh, don't be angry with me, cried the princess, clasping her hands. I would rather marry all the dwarfs. In the world, then die in this horrible way. Look at me, well, princess. Before you give me your word, say he, I do want you to promise me in a hurry. Oh, cried he, she, the lions are coming. I have looked at you enough. I am so frightened. Save me this minute, or I shall die of terror. Indeed, as she spoke, she fell down insensible. And when she recovered, she found herself in her own little bed at home. How she got there, she could not tell. But she was dressed in the most beautiful lace and ribbons, and on her finger was a little ring, made of a single red hair, which fitted so tightly that, try as she might, she could not get it off.
When the princess saw all these things and remembered that what had happened, she too fell into the deepest sadness, which surprised and alarmed the whole court. And the queen, more than anyone else, a hundred times, she asked Bellissima if anything was the matter with her, but she always said that there was nothing. At last, the chief men of the kingdom, anxious to see their princess married, sent to the queen to beg her to choose a husband for her as soon as possible. She replied that nothing would please her better, but that her daughter seemed so unwilling to marry, and she recommended them to go and talk to the princess about it themselves, so this they at once did. Now, Bellissima was much less proud seeing her adventure with the yellow dwarf, and she could not think of a better way of getting rid of the little monster than to marry some powerful king. Therefore, she replied to the request much more favorably than they had hoped, saying that though she was very happy as she was still to please them, she would consent to marry the king of the gold mines. Now, he was a very handsome and powerful, powerful prince who had been in love with the princess for years, but had not thought that she would ever care about him at all. You can easily imagine how delighted he was when he heard the news, and how angry it made all the other kings to lose forever the hope of marrying the princess. But, after all, Belisama could not have married twenty kings. Indeed, she had found it quite difficult enough to choose one, for her vanity made her believe that there was nobody in the world who was worthy for, of her. Preparations were begun at once for the grandest wedding that had ever been held at the palace. The king of the gold mines sent such immense sums of money that the whole sea was covered with the ships that brought it. Messengers were sent to all the gayest and the most refined courts, particularly to the courts of France, to sit out everything rare and precious to adorn the prince, to adorn the princess. Although her beauty was so perfect that nothing she wore could make her look prettier, at least that is what the king of the Gomas thought, and he was never happy unless he was with her. As for the princess, the more she saw the king, the more she liked him. He was so generous, so handsome and clever, that at last she was almost as much in love with him as she was with her. How happy they were as they wandered about in the beautiful gardens together, sometimes listening to sweet music, and the king used to write songs to Bellissima. This is one that she liked very much. In the forest all is gay, when my princess walks that way, all the blossoms then are found, thou wert fluttering to the ground. Hoping she may tread on them, and bright flowers on slender stem, gaze up at her as she passes, brushing lightly through the grasses. Oh, my princess, birds above, echo back our songs of love, as through this enchanted land, brides we wander hand in hand. They really were as happy as the day was long. And the king's unsuccessful rivals had gone home in despair. They said good bye to the princess so sadly that she could not help being sorry for them. <clears throat>
who love you so much that all their trouble would be well repaid by a single smile from you? I should be sorry, answered Bellissima. If you had not noticed how much I pitied these princes who were leaving me forever. But for you, sire, it is very different. You have every reason to be pleased with me. But they are going sorrowfully away, so you must not grudge them my compassion. The king of the gold mines was quite overcome by the princess's good nature way of taking his interference and throwing himself at her feet. She kissed her hand a thousand times and begged her to forgive him. At last, the happy day came. Everything was ready for Bellissima's wedding. The trumpets sounded. All the streets of the town were hung with flags and strewn with flowers. And the people ran in crowds to the great square before the palace. The queen was so overjoyed that she had hardly been able to sleep at all. And she got up before it was light to give the necessary orders and to choose the jewels that the princess was to wear. These were nothing less than diamonds, even to her shoes, which were covered with them, and her dress of silver brocade was embroidered with a dozen of the sun's rays. You may imagine how much this had cost, but then nothing could have been more brilliant except the beauty of the princess. Upon her head, she wore a splendid crown, her lovely hair waved nearly to her feet, and her stately figure could easily be distinguished. And her stately figure could easily be distinguished among all the ladies who attended her. The king of the gold mines was not less noble and splendid. It was easy to see by his face how happy he was. And every one who went near him returned loaded with presents, for all round the great Benkinte hall had been arranged a thousand barrels full of gold, and numberless and numberless bags made of velvet embroidered with pearls and filled with money, each one containing at least a hundred thousand gold pieces. Which were given away to everyone who liked to hold out his his hand, with numbers of people hustled to do. You may be sure, indeed, some found this by far the most amusing part of the wedding festivities. The queen and the princess were just ready to set out with the king, when they saw advancing toward them ran the end of the long gallery. Two great Belisi, two great Basilites, dragging after them a very badly made box. Behind them came a tall old woman, whose ugliness was even more surprising than her extreme old age. She wore a ruff of black taffeta, a red velvet hood, and a fatigue or in rage, and she leaned heavily upon a crutch. This strange old woman, without having a single word, hobbled three times around the gallery, followed by the basilites, then stopping in the middle, and bred, and brandishing her crutch, threateningly she cried, "Ho ho, queen! Ho ho, princess! Do you think you are going to bring with?" Impunity that promise that you make to my friend, the yellow dwarf. I am the fairy of the desert. Without the yellow dwarf and his orange tree, my great lions would soon have eaten you up. I can tell you, in and in fairyland, we do not suffer ourselves to be insulted like this. Make up your mind at once. What you will do? For I vow that you shall marry the yellow dwarf. If you do, may I burn your crutch? Oh, princess," said the queen, weeping. "What is this that I hear? What have you promised?" "Ah,、oh, my mother," 
replied Bellissima sadly. What did you promise yourself? The king of the gold mice. Indignant, the king of the gold mice, indignant at being kept from his happiness by this weak old woman, went up to her and threatening her with this sword, said. Get away of my country at once and forever, miserable creature, lest I take your life and so rid myself of your malice. He had, he had hardly spoken these words when he lit off the box, fell back on the floor with a terrible noise, and to their horror, out sprang the yellow dwarf, mounted upon a great Spanish cat. Rash youth, he cried. Rushing between the fairy of the desert and the king, dare to lay a finger upon this illustrious fairy. Your quarrel is with my only. I am your enemy and your rival. The faithless princess who would have married you is promised to me. See if she has not upon her finger a ring made of one of my hairs. Just try to take it off, and you will soon find out. While I am more powerful than you are, Wretched little monster," said the king. "Do you dare to call yourself the princess lover and to lay claim to such a treasure? Do you know that you are a dwarf, that you are so ugly that one cannot bear to look at you, and that I should kill you myself long before this if you had been worthy of such a glorious death?" So this is the part one of storytelling the yellow dwarf. So last but not least, subscribe to my YouTube channel, like my video, share my video. Remember to click on the bell. Okay. So when you click on the bell, please turn on the notification so that you can receive the immediate notification when I upload a new video every day. And comment below on any topic or any story you would like me to read, or you would like. Me to show you on the next video. So comment below on any opinions would you would like to tell me, and we'll see you on the next video, the part two of storytelling, the yellow dwarf. Bye.